Welcome to the University of Tennessee College of Social Work Social Justice Dialogue. The Social Justice Dialogue is an initiative of the College's Office for Equity and Inclusion. We aim to address social justice issues and experiences through a social work lens. This dialogue is managed and facilitated by brilliant social work students and faculty in the College of Social Work. We hope you enjoy and are enlightened by this conversation. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Horton. I'm a graduate student at the University of Tennessee College of Social Work, and I'll be facilitating this social justice dialogue about the importance of voting and voter engagement to the field of social work. And before I bring in my guests, I'll just set the stage with a little background. The University of Tennessee began recording social justice dialogues to engage the community on pressing and under-discussed issues that are a matter of social justice locally, nationally, and internationally. And when I saw the call for submissions, my mind immediately went to the importance of voting and political engagement to the field of social work. Yet, I think when most people think of social work, they don't usually think of um, politics, policy, and voting. Um, but, you know, social workers dating back to the settlement house movement have recognized the importance of voting to community empowerment and social justice. And in 2016, the National Social Work Voter Mobilization Campaign launched a website with the theme, Voting is Social Work. The American Medical Association recently recognized voting as a social determinant of health. And both the NASW Code of Ethics and the Co Council of Social Work Education Practice Standards reference the importance of voter um, participation to the profession and its work towards social justice for all people. But I know, based on conversations I've had with peers and folks working in the field of social work, that a lot of you out there aren't fully on board. So I reached out to some people in the field that I believe will be able to make the importance of this topic a little more clear. So I'm going to stop talking now and turn the stage over to them. And first of all, thank you again so much for being here today. I know we're getting into the holiday season. Um, several of you work in academia, and we're kind of right in the middle of that end of semester crush. Um, I have felt that too. So I really do appreciate each of you taking the time out of your busy lives to speak with us. So um, if you could each just kind of briefly introduce yourselves and then tell us um, first, why is voting social work? And second, um, what led you to make the convergence of social work and voter engagement a focus of yours? And I know just that first question alone could elicit some lengthy answers. So if you could just kind of boil it down to a few key ideas, and then we'll kind of dig more into some of the details and future questions. Um, Tanya, you're kind of at the top of my screen. So would you mind starting us off? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tanya Rhodes-Smith. I'm on the faculty at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work, and I'm the director of the um, Nancy A. Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work. And we were um, one of the co-founders of the National Social Work Voter Mobilization Campaign and host the Voting as Social Work uh, website. So um, we are immersed in voting as a social work intervention. Um, we believe that voter engagement is essential to a healthy community, a strong community, a, a building a community that is representative of the people, and we teach it as at, at UConn as a, as a social work intervention for all social workers. So thinking about all the ways that all the places that social workers um, are 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 practicing, so hospitals and libraries and and uh, mental health clinics, all of those places and spaces where people are, and the ten million people that we touch every day, um, that we have a very big role. We're very positioned to build that relationship around voting. So excited to be here. Um, and, and I would say that it really is a relationship. Um, and it, it the people who vote have better outcomes um, and communities that vote have better outcomes than those who don't. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Lee, could you could you go next? 
Sure. Uh, thank you for having uh, me here. Excited for this conversation. Uh, so I am a uh, licensed clinical social worker. Uh, right now, I'm a behavioral health and racial equity consultant. I have about 10 years of clinical experience with a particular expertise in substance use. Um, and I was lucky enough to be introduced to VODR uh, when I was frustrated about the lack of uh, census engagement and voter registration engagement that my uh, healthcare setting was not engaging in. Uh, so someone shared with me the great work that VODR is, is doing, and um, I have been uh, able to be a part of the growing uh, presence of and leadership of social work there, uh, which has been really awesome. Uh, I'm in the member uh, provider circle of ODR and most recently uh, helped with a mobilization effort to uh, get more voter registration tools, particularly into substance use uh, service uh, settings. I'm particularly passionate about the opioid epidemic and, and this past election particularly was very important uh, when thinking about the direction of, of that crisis. Um, so really was excited to, to get to be a part of that and also all the, the awesome work here. So thank you for having me. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for um, sharing all that. Um, Suzanne, let's hear from you. All right. Um, well, thank you for including me in this conversation. I'm really excited um, and glad to be here with, with all the other folks um, on this call. Um, so I am a faculty member at the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work. Um, I lead the political social work programming at the University of Houston that includes a political social work focused learning opportunity, an Austin legislative internship program where students intern at the state capitol in an immersive internship and a voter engagement and political justice initiative there. Um, and I also do, my research is really focuses on using community engaged research methods to examine um, community perceptions of barriers to civic engagement and to, to, um, to, to, to use that knowledge in order to challenge those barriers and expand political voice. Um, I also, alongside Shannon, um, co-authored a book um, entitled Political Social Work, um, Using Power to Create Social Change. Um, so, so all my work is really grounded in civic engagement and political social work. So this is something that I, I feel very passionately about. Um, to me, voting um, is so critical to social work because it's, it's really um, speaks to exactly what our code of ethics and our core values speak to. Um, voting is a critical way that people are able to express self-determination, um, to have voice in decision-making that affects their own lives. Um, it's really about meaningful participation. Um, so really core aspects of our code of ethics and also voting um, and, and the civic voice that comes around and connected with, vo with voting is really critical to advancing equity and social justice, which is so critical to the work that we do as social workers. Um, so for me, my background before coming to social work was actually working in policy. I worked um, both in um, a executive agency and then in the legislature in Virginia. And in that work repeatedly, I saw while we were doing some good policy work, it wasn't really connected to the communities that were experiencing the impacts of policy. And there really weren't mechanisms um, that that enabled participation um, from people affected by policy. And so for me, I actually came to social work really interested in being part of a profession that um, really supported work to change that, to really change who's part of influencing policy, whose voices are heard in the policy process. And I think voting and really influencing who is there at the table making policy decisions is so critical to what we do as social workers. So again, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's cool that you came from the other side. So that's neat. Um, Shannon. Hi, I'm Shannon Lane. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a faculty member at the Wurzweiler School of Social Work um, in New York. Um, and as Suzanne mentioned, um, co-author of the Political Social Work book, which is right there. Um, and um, I um, 
like Suzanne, I had experience in the legislature before I came into social work. Um, so I worked on Capitol Hill for Senator Tom Daschle um, for about a decade. And I got my MSW in the middle of that and sort of realized that what I had been missing working on the Hill was this ethic driven, um, social justice oriented approach. Um, and one of the things that I have been able to do since I've been at Wordsweiler is that we recently received a grant from the New York Community Trust uh, to start a political justice fellowship program, which is based on the work that Suzanne and Alessandro Lozano did in uh, sort of thinking about political justice as um, something something that we need to be talking about in the profession, in addition to the, the broader thinking about social justice and economic justice. And for me, voting fits so centrally into that idea of political justice um, that it's not just about having outcomes of policy that we're happy with, but it's about making making sure that everyone has access to the policy process, um, whether that's voting or being an advocate, right? It's like, so thinking about equity from a much different perspective than I think traditional policy um, makers have. Um, and so in addition to working with my political justice fellows, I have the opportunity to serve as the deputy registrar of voters in my town, which means I get to administer elections, which is mostly a lot of fun and occasionally extremely exhausting, um, but is um, I think uh, something that I'm, one of the things I'm trying to get more social workers to do is to get involved on the voter engagement side, but also to understand the voter administration side and have a better idea of how elections are run. Um, there's a huge opportunity for social workers to make sure that when voters walk in the door in a polling place, they're treated in a fair and equitable manner. Um, and I think that's one of the ways that this work that we're doing just has so many opportunities for social workers to do it in um, a different way than the systems have traditionally done. Um, and so the other thing I just wanted to say is I wanted to give a shout out to Nancy Humphreys, who founded the Political Institute, uh, where Tanya works and where I get to work. Um, Nancy and um, Bob Fisher, who is at the University of Houston, were talking about political social work and voting, the, talking about these concepts way before 2016, way before the other people in the profession were paying attention to it. So I just want to give a shout out to those people who really paved the way for the work that we're doing. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you for bringing them in. Um, Christina, last but not least. Yeah, thank you so much. And I am honored and thrilled to be here amongst all of my my colleagues who I've just seen their names on the cover of books. So it's nice to uh, be in the same room with you all. Uh, I am Christina Witten O'Brien. I use she, her pronouns. I am also a licensed independent clinical social worker. Uh, and I am the National Partnerships Director at Vote ER. Uh, Vote ER is a nonprofit organization with the mission of healthy communities powered by an inclusive democracy. And what we do is we create resources, tools, and training, uh, like this QR code that you'll see here, uh, that are tools for social workers, nurses, physicians to utilize in their practice with patients and clients so that when a social worker is doing an intake or a biopsychosocial assessment um, or discharging a patient from the hospital, one of the questions that they can integrate into their interaction is, oh, and by the way, are you registered to vote? Because what we're doing at VoteR is really seeing the correlation between health and uh, voter engagement. And I also was able in, in this position, and you mentioned uh, the AMA resolution for social determinants of health. I actually worked with a group of medical students that authored that resolution and helped move that through in partnership with other organizations. So it's really exciting to be on the front lines of this work and developing the resources, tools, and trainings that social workers can really integrate into their practice. So as my colleagues have said, you know, this is literally our job to be engaged uh, with voter registration, to think about the civic health and well-being of the clients and the communities that we service. Because as I said earlier, the data really shows that individuals who vote feel better their health outcomes are better and communities that have high voting turnout actually are healthier communities and there's very strong data uh, to support that. 
Um, how did I get here? Uh, I trained as a clinician and through my journey of kind of going up the food chain into management, uh, I worked in uh, the nonprofit world. I've worked for state organizations. I actually also work for the National Association of Social Workers. And through the clinical work that I was doing in the program development, always understood the impact of policies on the work that we would do. Um, and, you know, would we have enough funding? I've been able to testify before the legislature asking for funding, lobbying for different types of bills that would improve uh, the, the community well-being and health of our clients. Um, I am also in full disclosure, married to an elected official. So it's definitely part of my personal life as well. And that informs a lot of, of, of my experience. But, um, you know, was introduced to voting as social work uh, when I worked at Boston University School of Social Work. And what we did there was really try to bring voter registration to our students, uh, similar, using the tools that uh, voting as social work created and uh, training field instructors, training community organizations, so that this was something that was in the fabric of our social work students so that when they went into practice that they understood this importance. So it's been uh, a full circle experience uh, for me in terms of my career and where I am and uh, really, really excited to continue the conversation with everybody here today. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. I love that you all came to this from such kind of diverse backgrounds and all ended up kind of in a, a similar place and just I guess what struck me about all of your answers is just how complementary um, politics and social work are and how they really kind of complement each other in that way. So that's really neat. Um, I guess um, something that's maybe on all of our minds is just with the midterms having just concluded and we have local elections coming up and the presidential election is kind of looming. Um, what all what are the implications of the voting as social work theme for social workers as we look ahead to future elections? And I know, Tanya, you had some thoughts you wanted to share about local elections. Do you kind of want to take this one first? Sure, I'll start and everyone can, can jump in. But um, I see local elections as essential. When you ask people whether or not they voted, they will often say, oh, I, I am a voter. And they think about voting in the presidential election. Or when they say nothing changes, they still think about that presidential election. But it's it's local elections that have, have an enormous impact on our lives and are really where our relationship with civic engagement should start. And, and people across the country are most disconnected. What should be our most accessible and accountable level of government is often our um, least understood and, and um, have the lowest turnout. So across the nation, on average in local elections, people turn out at um, about 25%. And that compares to 67% of, of eligible voters in a national election. When we think of, when we drill down on that, what we see is that in cities and, and particularly in underserved community, communities, the turnout is significantly lower. Um, the turnout in 10 of our largest 30 cities is below 15%. And what that does is create this sort of unhealthy, toxic power within a community because only 15% have a, a, a say about the policies and the elected officials that are within that community. Voting is power. So I, I, I see the other opportunity for local is really to create that relationship with government. Local government is where leaders start. You know, we, they, you know, they move, they don't just, usually they don't just appear um, into as a congressional you know, candidate. They, they start as local leaders. And when we look at who's missing, from party committees who are determining who's on the ballot and how many people are turning out, we see this, this disconnect. And I, I, before I turn it over, I know my colleagues will have a lot to say about this too, but what I, what I also think we need to think about are policies that make it really difficult for people to participate in local elections because it's very hard to find information about your local, who's on the ballot locally across the country particularly in underserved com communities, we think about, for example, we think about the League of Women Voters. Well, they're not often active in, in communities that we would consider um, underserved. 
And secondly, we have this impact of, of um, policies like felony disenfranchisement, which has this sort of ripple effect into, into the um, civic life of families, because that's also one of the first places we learn around civic life. So when you take away a right to vote, um, that can have a generational impact. So, so for lots of reasons, I think local is, is enormously important. I know I'm preaching to the choir in this group, but um, I am excited about the opportunities for 2023 and to really change that conversation. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll add to that as somebody who ran for local office and lost by 47 votes um, in 2021. But, you know, often the things that social workers and social work students and our clients, the things that we care most about, many of those things are primarily controlled at the local level, right? So I ran for school board because my kids go to a school that doesn't have a school social worker. And I think that that's unacceptable. Um, and, you know, if you care about policing, right, then you care about local politics because your town and city are probably the people who decide what the police presence looks looks like in your town. Um, and so I think that one of the, you know, Tanya mentioned often people get frustrated with elections because things don't change. And often that's because any change that we're looking for, we're looking for the federal government to make a change when it's really a change that our town or our city has to do. Um, and so I think it's been sort of a contentious time in local politics in many places. You know, school board meetings are much more contentious than they used to be, you know, and a lot of that reflects our national political environment. Um, but it still is such an opportunity to know that your vote matters and to see a real direct, sometimes pretty immediate impact of your vote on the, the policies and the, the people that you care about. We did some work uh, prior to, in 2021, actually, uh, with Hit Strategies, which is a, um, a research group that focuses on uh, historically marginalized communities, young people. And as they were talking to folks uh, through their, their focus groups, you know, they said, you know, why don't you vote? And the answer was, well, my vote doesn't matter. Nothing changes when I vote. And they said, well, what do you want to, what do you want to see change? And they said, we need more resources. We need more resources. And when you think about to what Tanya and Shannon were saying, resources that come into the community, the local level, that's what you have to, you know, look towards is who is, who is your mayor? Who's on your city council? And I think what we saw with the pandemic recently, it was local boards of health. It was local selectmen uh, who were voting or city councilors who were voting about masks in school, masking for businesses, vaccination mandates. Those are things that impacted people's individual lives during the pandemic and continue to do so. And yet, you know, my town right before that election had a 9% turnout in a local election. Um, and so we, what we need to do is realize, to Shannon's point, is that for issues that we care about, criminal justice, health, uh, health is always on the ballot. You know, we need to take a look at who's making those decisions in our community and are expressing our voice at those elections and really talking about that from trusted messengers who are social workers. Social workers, nurses, and doctors are all trusted messengers and have that ability to engage in those conversations. And again, that's kind of why we should be thinking about that and empowering, um, you know, helping people find their own power in this process. And coming from one of those large um, cities with extremely low turnout in local elections and often single digit turnout in local elections, I think this is really critical. And this is a role where to me, I'm a big proponent in social workers need to vote, but we also really need to take on that role of helping to facilitate access to information. Like Tani was talking about, the information just isn't there. Like, how do you... When, when is, you know, for us too. So I think, you know, Shannon mentioned the political justice work, but coming from the South as well, I have major awareness of the role of political, of, bar of <coughs> barriers to, um, to voting. And so one of the things, for example, is that often in Southern states, like we just saw in Georgia this week, there's a sort of whole runoff process, right? So in a lot of 
in outside of the South, typically, if you have the plurality of votes, you win the election. Um, in the South, we often have multiple runoff elections until somebody has the majority over 50% of the vote. And so by the time you're at a late mid-December election, that is the multiple election in a row to decide who's on the city council, who's showing up for that election? Who's even paying attention to that's happening? Where's the information? It's confusing. What, didn't I just vote last month? Like the media has stopped talking about it unless it's, you know, a Senate election. But that the, the, the ways in which it is just really hard for people to even know there is election, to know what issues are on the ballot, what candidates are on the ballot, what it stands for, and all of that, I think that that's a place where our access as social workers, the relationships we build in community really enable us to help to make sure we know that and to help transmit that information because it can be there are so I, I mean I'm really the the structural barriers that keep people from being able to participate in elections to me is actually going back to your original question, Jennifer, why it's so critical that social workers be involved. Because these structures, these barriers exist for a reason. And they exist because there are many voices that are not wanted in the political arena that are not wanted in selecting who our candidates are and those are the communities that we're part of that we work with as social workers that are that you know that that are really critical to be at the at the table so i think that what you know the local election conversation we're having now or jennifer back to the sort of midterm as well we saw a lot of strong turnout and yet strong turnout like in a place like where I live still means that 40% of folks you know, are not showing up to vote. And, and, and I think that a lot of that is around the barriers, is around the things that make it so hard. Here, we have the longest ballot in the country. I flipped 120 some odd screens to vote. Right. Like, so you stand in line because also lines exist. I used to, I used to think lines were a great thing. It means people want to vote. Lines mean there are not enough places and enough right for people to vote. And so you stand in line and then you go in and you got to flip 120 screens and then something goes wrong with your paper ballot and this and this and this. Right. And you're there for hours. Who, who has time for that? So you don't show up and it, it comes across like, oh, you know, I'm not interested or I don't have time. This isn't a priority. But really, the system is set up to make it really difficult. And I think that that's something as social workers, when we look at all of these other systems and all of these inequities, we really need to be sort of both balancing how do we go out and vote, how do we help transmit information, and how do we challenge these barriers that were so apparent even as recently as, these, as the midterm elections. Yeah, thank you. Um... I appreciate you all highlighting all those things. So it's not really just about engaging with people or, you know, clients and communities on a direct level, but just the structural um, issues too that social workers can play a role in. And I know a few of you mentioned resources and something that kind of stuck out to me when I was doing some of this research was just that it's not even just like the outcomes of elections that matter, but just like turnout when elected officials see that certain communities turn out in higher numbers, they pay more attention and give those areas more resources because that's their, those are their employers basically. So they have a vested interest in um, giving those people resources. So just having higher turnout can um, have a positive impact on folks. So was there any, any more comments on that question before we move on? I, I wanted to add that, you know, it, it does have an impact being a voter and also how isolating it is to be a non-voter. Because when you are a non-voter and you are not registered or you do not vote, parties and campaigns are exist to win elections. And they will mobilize voters, but they ignore non-voters. So all of us who receive all the information that when you think about, oh, I, I got five flyers in the mail today, so you have at least an idea of who's, who's in the race, non-voters don't get those. They're expensive to mail and, and generally they're ignored by campaigns. So again, it's this reinforcing isolation. And then also on the local level, we can see that things like, um, they, I stood at the polls on election day and many will say, no one's ever knocked on my door. 
You know, I have no relationship with my city council. Maybe it's an at-large city council, meaning they represent the whole the whole city. And so, you know, we just have so many opportunities to change it. But that manufactured myth of my vote doesn't count is exactly what Suzanne said. It's it, it's manufactured by structural barriers, but it becomes their own narrative. So it's engaging them first is is really important. And I just I just want to emphasize that because I think to our audience, it can feel a little overwhelming, everything <laughs> that we just kind of laid out. And what I wanted to just touch on is that there is the my vote doesn't count, but there's also a lot of people and research has shown us that say the reason I don't vote is because I've never been asked. And we know in local elections, as was already mentioned, right, there's less people asking people, even less, right, in some communities, no one is, um, but even in communities during kind of those higher stakes elections, um, there are people who are coming in and asking that. Um, we can be that sustained voice, right? We are in these communities day in, day out. We can be that sustained engagement. And it's as simple a lot of times as just simply asking, are you registered to vote? So I do just want to say, I think there's all of this, but there's also just simply that very simple question is so powerful and is the instigator of that longer term feedback loop that we're talking about, where then the political process starts engaging these people who have been marginalized and we then get better public health outcomes when those people are then in that feedback loop and are being listened to about what their needs um, are and then those resources are met. Um, so I also just kind of wanted to crystallize that it really also is just that simple in a lot of cases and, and in a lot of ways. Yeah, thank you um, for highlighting that. It's a good transition, actually, into the next couple of questions, which I'd kind of like, this is all such great information and motivation and um, reasons for why to get involved. And I guess I'd like to take us into more maybe some actionable steps that folks can take who are maybe listening and they're like, okay, all this sounds great, but now what do I do? And um, maybe let's start with what can... Um, what can schools of social work do to impress upon future social workers the importance of voter engagement and policy? And maybe with that, you know, the relationship with field placements. And I know, Tanya, you said UConn does some stuff with this. And um, Suzanne, I think you mentioned that you had some stuff going on, too. So I'd love to hear from you all about advice for, you know, my professors or um, the dean who may be listening. What, um, what would you like them to hear? Do you want to start, Suzanne? Okay. All right. I'll start. Um, so we developed, and I um, this came about actually predates me for for the last twenty eight years, as as Shannon Lane mentioned, that Nancy Humphreys has been emphasizing the importance of of agency based voter registration, so that that students should be doing voter registration projects at the, their field agencies for 28 years. So, and I was a student, uh, 24 of them with Dr. Humphreys. So I, I had firsthand experience, but I also had firsthand experience of seeing that most students just ignored it. Most students and field and field supervisors would say, that's not, we're not political. Students, particularly our clinical ones would say, that's not relevant to my practice. And so in 2015, um, I uh, met Dr. Mary Hilton at the University of Nevada, Reno. I pulled in Shannon and we developed the, um, uh, the voter engagement model for schools of social work. And what we, we now have um, eight years of data to show that when you embed a unit on nonpartisan voter engagement into a social work class and you give students an assignment based in their field that recognizes that they don't have power, but also gives them the critical thinking skills that they need to bring this to their future practice. So not only giving them experience registering voters, but thinking about what a, 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 a culture of voting um, would look like if it was embedded into a social state service agency. So we have them do this organizational assessment and, um, and, and we've, we've seen, and, and the requirement they have to register three voters. And we don't say you have to register clients. We say you can register anybody. We use the vote ER tools. We love that because then students don't have to focus on the, all of the rules. They get to focus on the ask and the relationship. And, um, and then we addressed 
we 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 did that for a few years. We saw the field was really the barrier. So then we we started training our field supervisors. And now we have really good data. And just a couple of things to say about that is, is you know, 88% of students um, at the end of the semester after registering voters and doing their assignments reported that voting was important to their practice. That was up 44%. 95% um, say that they will encourage others to vote when they are social workers. Um, all of them, I, the, the numbers are in the 90s for their, their intentions to vote in all elections, particularly federal, but even on the local level, it goes up to, to, um, to, to 60% say, yes, I'll get involved on the local level. So, you know, it, we're, we're seeing the impact that it plays and, and we're trying to create the tools that all faculty can do to, to embed this into their classroom without having to reinvent the wheel. So, um, I'm sure I, I missed a few things, but I know Shannon will fill in and, and Suzanne, they do, also does incredible things. So I'm going to stop here. So I would just add a couple of things. That's exactly what Tanya said, uh, talked about is really critical. They've done some incredible work in practicum um, around, around voter registration. But so I... So it's a little dated now, but um, uh, prior to the 2016 election that I think activated a lot of social work programs, over a third of social work programs were not offering or connecting students with any sort of voter registration effort. I think we need to start there. Like if we're not even talking about voting, if we're not facilitating access for our own students to vote and showing that that matters in the schema of social work, then we're not doing these, the other things that we're talking about, right? So I think a very initial entry point is to facilitate voter registration and to you know, have a table or connect with other um, efforts, invite, you know, third party organizations that come in and do voter registration if you don't have the resources that you know bring the vote ER, right but 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 bringing voter registration in i think is a beginning um start i think also our policy classes can integrate voting and in. i think we stay away sometimes from voting because it starts to veer into partisan but there are so many tools there things that have been shared today to talk about elections in nonpartisan ways and, and to connect that to all the, I mean, we, all of our students have a policy practice competency. Um, and so voting is part of that, right? Um, and I think we need to be more explicit about it. I'd like to see CSWE be more explicit about it, um, but also we can do that in our, in our policy classes. I think something that I've learned is I start our foundation policy class with a who represents me exercise where students just have to look up who represents them at all levels of government. So at, to the point about sort of not even knowing what's going Um, what, who is my city council member? Who represents me? And then we talk about who are these people? Why do they matter? And I think that is just we, you know, we can help sort of set the groundwork for voting by also talking about and helping helping students get that information for themselves. And that fits really well in a policy class and helps to make the connection about why it matters. I also something that we have done um, at the University of Houston is really also sort of a culture of embedding political justice as part of talking about social justice or alongside. So we actually start our students um, really their first day in our program um, and talking about why political justice is important to social work, how politi how voting and social work connect, all the things we've been talking about here, we communicate that as a college to our students so that, and I think that's important too because of sort of this whole sort of, even the initial premise of this conversation that social workers often don't see that connection. I think establishing that, that it is connected, that this is part of what we do is so critical um, to then build, um, have lots of other thoughts, but I think that those are really important starting points to sort of really instill the connection and why, why voting matters and how it is part of social work and not something outside of social work. I just want to add, first of all, I think the 
I think both Tanya and Suzanne have emphasized the importance of, of partnerships, right? Particularly if you live in a state where there's a lot of rules around voting, it can be really um, it can be really intimidating. And so, for example, the the program that Tanya talked about, Nevada has pretty stringent laws around voter registration. And so in Nevada, we partnered with an organization that's very familiar with those rules that could sort of be our, make sure that we are not accidentally disenfranchising voters or breaking any of those rules. Um, there's a great um, resource called the Cost of Voting Index that can help you look at what the voting laws look like where you are and um, get a sense of sort of you know, how stringent the rules are, but you really do need in a lot of states, you need to have somebody with you. Um, and I think what's one of the things I love about Vote ER is that folks are registering themselves, right? We're, I'm not registering you, you're registering yourself. And that is very effective with a lot of these, um, these you know, stringent voter laws that are really about voter suppression. Um, the other thing I think is that we have to, you know, I, what I love about the Who Represents Me assignment is we're sort of saying to students, it's okay if you walk in the door and you're just not sure how this all works. Like civics education has gotten less and less space in American education and we don't all know and we can learn about it together. And I think that's a really important, you know, having very achievable assignments for students. My students do a flyer where they pick one aspect of voting and do a flyer that describes like what are the important, you know, laws in that way or, you know, Tanya's assignment where you're registering three voters, you know, giving people an accessible way in, I think is really crucial to building some feelings of self-efficacy and building people's feelings that this is something they can do. And I just want to add, if anybody is feeling really inspired by listening to all of these ideas, uh, VODIAR is sponsoring our second annual uh, Social Work Healthy Democracy campaign in March of 2023, where we invite schools of social work students from all across the country to engage in a very friendly competition uh, to see who, what impact social work students can have on registering uh, clients to vote. Uh, so we use our tools, as uh, Shannon mentioned, that are allowing individuals to register themselves. Uh, we provide digital kits. We provide badges to schools that are co-branded with the school logo. Uh, and we have impact boards. So there's some gamification where students can see how they're doing, how many people they've registered themselves, how many people their school has registered. Uh, so it's a really kind of fun and exciting way to introduce it to students. And we all know everybody loves gamification and digital digital kinds of tools in this era. So uh, if anybody has any interest in that, can certainly reach out to us at VODIAR. Uh, also, if people are really inspired, you can order your own badge off of our website and get going uh, with voter registration as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'll try to, um, I think we can probably link a lot of these resources that you guys are sharing. Um, in the show notes, as they say. Um, so I'll try to see if there's a way we can do that. Um, Lee, you unmuted yourself. Did you have something you wanted to add? I was just going to add, if you are ordering your badge on your own, there's also free scripts on the website. Um, so just that that's a good companion if you're kind of thinking about ordering the badge. Yeah, that's awesome. We'll link to those too, because I those can be really helpful, I think, for folks who are kind of wanting to get involved, but they're like, how do I, how do I bring this up to a client or whatever? So I know a lot of you are going to have to jump off here in a few minutes, so I guess in the interest of time and um, the about 10 minutes we have left, I'm going to just crush a few questions together and let you guys respond to whatever you want. Um, so we kind of talked about what schools of social work can do, field placement, supervisors. What are steps for, um, for other people listening, maybe students right now or people in clinical um, clinical social work who... I found can sometimes feel like this is a macro thing. Um, although in full disclosure, I'm a clinical concentration student. So <laughs> um, so what can those people take? What kind of steps can they take to um, get involved and to elevate this issue in the field? And then the other question I'm gonna dump on you here at the end is um, if there's anyone in any of those roles who still is just feeling a little bit on the fence or not completely convinced, you know, um, like I personally brought this up at my field placement and it's like, that's a good idea, but you know, do we have the time or the resources? Is that really part of our mission? And um, what can those types of people do who feel like they're 
crunched for time, don't have a lot of resources. They're laser focused on attending to people's most pressing needs. Um, why should they care and what should they do? So grab bag, um, whatever y'all want to answer of, of any of that, I, that'd be great. So I guess I'll take the second question. I think, you know, um, I'm really excited for the social work profession conversation to transition from, are we allowed to do this? What's the cost of us doing this to what's the cost if we don't? You know, we have an ethical obligation to provide the people we serve with the most effective best practice treatments. This is one of the best, most effective clinical treatments that we, no matter what setting you work in, what population you work with, that you can provide um, to the communities that you serve. And so we really have um, an ethical obligation. I think also if we think about things like the Notion National Voter Registration Act, where federal um, organizations that serve vulnerable populations have a legal obligation to be doing this in their work, that includes us. Um, so I think we really, I'm really hoping we kind of transition this conversation to really um, you know, as a profession, uh, what is the cost if we don't do this? We're also seeing many other professions at VODR. We work with doctors, nurses, right? They're all getting on this train. Um, and so we really have a chance to, to step out as leaders um, in this uh, movement. And I'm really excited for the profession. Um, and also just to encourage people to pay attention, the Supreme Court decision that's happening right now, uh, pay attention to the analysis of uh, kind of what happened in the midterms and what are our learning um, experiences from that. Um, and really just kind of commit to the to the long uh, journey that all of this is. This is not going to be over in one election, the next election or the next. Really, how do we take this on as a, a long, lifelong professional uh, commitment? Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. And I'll just briefly piggyback off of what Lee was saying. Um, just to say to folks, you know, check out that resources uh, page and, and reach out. Um, there is support if you're concerned or timid or don't feel like this is something that you have confidence in. Uh, you know, the resources, the tools, the training, the support is all there for you. We have monthly meetings with social workers from all across the country <clears throat> strategizing. You're welcome to come to a meeting uh, and learn more about not only our tools, but how we can advance this uh, in our profession. Anybody here is welcome to come too. Uh, but now I think, uh, you know, what I often say to the students that I work with, even still at Boston University, is that you should never do anything alone. That's one of the great things about the social work profession is that we're all here to support one another. And um, there's definitely support in doing this uh, so that you can feel like uh, you have the self-efficacy and the tools and the training you need to go forward and engage in this work. Yeah, thank you. I, I have a couple of ideas. Um, one is that I agree with Lee wholeheartedly. We have to change the conversation in our own profession. And I think that, you know, I, I worked in um, a domestic violence agency for a number of years and, and when we think about power dynamics and we, you know, we have to stop saying our client, this isn't a priority for our clients. We, you know, we, it's our job to give them power, um, to help them find their own voice and to help them find their own power. And I think this is a real uh, paradigm shift that our, that our, our profession needs to take. Um, we, we are founded as a political profession. We, you know, voter turnout, voter engagement relates directly to our impact. So um, for students, you can add a voter activity to your educational contract. It ties to all nine competencies um, in, in, um, that, that we focus on in, in uh, social work education. And we've got sample activities on voting as social work. So I would say there, start there. I would say absolutely go through the exercise of looking up who represents you, particularly on the local level. It will, it will help you understand your own community. Ask the question, you know, what, what voter turnout. You can look in, your, in any city and see where voter turnout is highest that's where the power is. The streets are probably better. The parks are probably better. The schools are probably better. So, so it's tangible to, to look at voter turnout as a, as, as, um, a metric of, of health and outcomes. And, and then last, I would say, um, you know, think about your agencies. 
when to vote, where do people have the information? Are we asking them if they're registered? That simple question that Lee said, but also don't stop at registration. Um, we need to be help, get, helping them find information about candidates and then promoting elections so that they actually have the tools that they need to get to elections. What I love about VoteYR's platform um, and their, their work, they use TurboVote and they will, they, they will text me. Anyone who is registered through their platform gets a text message before every election, local, special, national, with where you're registered and your polling place and a reminder to vote. And that is also capacity building. So lots, lots of easy ways that we can all um, you know, work to support people to vote. I just want to quickly plug to the VoteYR tools. Data is showing that all the strategies just mentioned by Tanya are working. Um, so people who are registered through VoteYR tools are actually more likely to then follow through with voting than people who are registered in other ways, uh, particularly in most marginalized populations like young people, uh, people of color and low income people. So something else I want to just quickly mention is that I think also something else that, that clinical social workers can do is to learn, kind of find out more about the rules that impact voting for their particular population, because then they can also help sort of help clients navigate some of these barriers that exist. Like what are the rights to translation um, for people who need language assistance? Um, there are states that have rules, for example, that survivors of violence can keep their address confidential, but somebody may never even want to go and register to vote because they're worried that their address would be public, right? Um, that folks who are homeless have the right, you know, may have the right to vote at a specific geographic location, but they may think that they don't have the right to vote. Like this is something we know actually like in Texas for example many um formerly incarcerated folks don't know that they have the right to have to be able to vote once they're they're off paper once they've had it, that they can have their right to vote restored and social workers that work with them are not telling them this and so I think there is work that we can do too to just really build our knowledge about how voting, what is voting access for the individual populations we work with, and then just build that into our conversations and the work that we do, because then we can also help, like, help them navigate and address these barriers um, that may keep them from ever even pursuing getting registered to vote, for example. And the other suggestion I'm going to make is uh, even ask if you if you're a student, ask if you can get field hours to take election day and go work the polls. Um, and if you're a clinical social worker or you know a practicing social worker, ask if you can have the day off to go work. Um, it's paid in most places. And this year on election day, I helped a new U.S. citizen vote for the first time. I helped five 18 year olds vote for the first time. Like election there's a lot going on right a lot of it is is overwhelming and hard and there's just nothing better than i mean in our polling place when somebody votes for the first time the whole room cheers for them and it's it's a wonderful reminder that all of this work that we do pays off in individual people accessing something that is a fundamental human right and it's a wonderful way to keep yourself engaged and motivated and uh and i encourage everybody to do it Thank you all so much. Perfect, um, perfect ending, perfect timing. I really do appreciate everyone's time today. You brought so much great information and energy and passion to this conversation. And I could talk to you for hours, but um, we don't have hours. So thank you again all so much. And um, hope everyone got something out of this and we'll add those resources um, to the recording for people to access. So thank you.